I want first take the opportunity to thank the organizers to have me here at this great place with great people and great surrounding um, to give a lecture about um, vocal control mechanisms in the mammalian brain. So again, we are, yes, they heard a lot about um, language and language processing, and today there is a lot about mammals, about um, vocal control mechanisms in mammals, and so I will kind of add on what um, Julia um, started this morning and we'll dive in a little bit into the uh, neural mechanisms that are underlying this behavior in mammals, um, but we'll also talk about some some behavioral aspects still because I think with the behavior cannot work without the, the neural underlying neural mechanism and, and the other way around. So, well, we have a lot about, heard a lot about, uh, well, that maybe uh, mammals are or are not a nice model to study um, the evolution of speech or to look at specific processes that correlate with speech. Um, that, that can be one reason uh, to uh, study uh, vocal behavior in mammals, but still I have to say I think Another really great reason to study vocal behavior in mammals is that it's a really nice model to study adaptive behavior in an animal model and also to see how this um, behavior can be changed or modulated um, by several, several stimuli, either by the interior milieu or by auditory stimulation, visual stimulation. And it's also a behavior that we can find in more or less in all mammals. I know you always have to be careful when saying all mammals. There's mostly one or two animals that don't vocalize, but I'm very sure that almost all animals are, um, mammals are producing vocalizations. Um, and they're doing this on different complexity levels, right? So there are mammals that are producing alarm calls, so just by the visual inspection of a predator, for, for example, animals are producing alarm calls to warn the others. Then we have some animals that are using calls um, to mark the territories, to make sure that not other animal, mammals, in this case, um, orangutans, are crossing the borders. Um, there are some, uh, yeah, some, t some mammals that are showing off with their vocalizations. Some of them are even using these vocalizations um, in a very specialized way to hunt their prey. So we have uh, several animals, not only bats, also some uh, um, 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 animals like um, yeah, whales and dolphins that are also using echolocation, so to use the vocalizations to produce them and from the returning echo to get information about their surrounding and also to detect their prey in, in their, um, in their, where, where they're living. So, and of course, not to forget the humans, also humans are producing vocalization, not only human speech, also vocalization per se, but we'll come to this later. First, to get everybody on the same page, so what, what is kind of the motivation of this talk? Um, I know this is a very simplified way to, uh, to uh, kind of define uh, what, um, communication. However, it, it, it fits to what I want to, uh, want to um, tell you um, is, um, uh, well, we have, there is the sender. Um, in this case, um, it's a Barbary macaque that is producing a vocalization. Um, a signal, and to produce this vocalization, the monkey has a specific motivation to produce this vocalization, and then this, um, this vocalization is um, encoded and produced, uh, transmitted to a receiver, and in the receiver, also a lot of things are going on as soon as the animal is receiving the signal. So it is, first of all, it, it has to perce perceive the signal, then it is an analyzing the signal. So well, this is from a from a familiar animal or from a, for a foreigner or from, from a completely different other animal, not from a conspecific. It is evaluating that signal so that what Julia was talking about, that um, um, decision making that has to take place and then the animal can react. And uh, ideally, if it's a, um, communi in a communication world, it would also then answer with another vocalization, right? And therefore, um, be the be the sender in the next in the next way, and so why did I put all these points here a little bit further up? That's just so that I can make a nice ellipse around it because all of these parts um, uh, that are crucial for for vocal communication, we need this this little organ here. We need the brain. All of these things are happening in the brain. Without the brain, there won't be vocal communication. Also, not in mammals, even though that they might not need the cortex. In most cases, we'll come to this um, later, um, we need the brain. And I think it's crucial to understand the um, underlying neural mechanisms of this behavior so that we can further understand or go the next step to understand the behavior the animals are doing. And also the other way around, um, to understand the neural mechanisms, we also have to understand the behavior and to 
kind of look at the behavior that the animals are doing. So, you see there are several dif uh, different um, parts of this vocal communication network or system and of course for each of these um, parts there are maybe the ideal animal model or a ideal animal model to uh, work on these different um, parts of this vocal communication and this actually is the reason why this brought me to uh, several animal models so far so since we always tried also my, my PIs and, and I try to use the ideal model to study specific um, yeah, characteristics of this vocal communication behavior. Um, everything started um, in my vocal communication career in the PhD I did with um, Jürgens in Göttingen, starting with the squirrel monkeys, and then it brought me via um, the echolocating horseshoe bats to uh, uh, rhesus monkeys, um, a little excursion with mice, but really just a brief excursion, and then now since, um, since a year or so we are working with marmoset monkeys since they are a, an ideal model for several questions we want, we want to ask. So in my talk today, if I'm not talking about data of others, I'm mainly focusing on the work um, we did here on these three species, these two monkey species on, on the horseshoe bat. So again, I think you just started this this morning already, we first have to define so what vocalization is actually. So what is mammalian vocalization? And I think um, as Julia already pointed out, is in, in that way important, also important maybe to hear it twice, um, is the reason that in the, especially in the last, last month, there are several papers coming out showing well that there are mammals out there that they are do, doing, what, that they're having vocal learning and it's so similar to human speech and that we can use it for human speech um, to make clear what actually mammalian vocalization is and what parts of this mammalian vocalization from a neurophysiological basis we might be able to use as a model for parts of human speech. So the first part is, I said already, so these vocalizations are, um, in contrast to human speech, mammalian vocalizations are mainly innate, so that means the animals do not have to learn these patterns. Um, so the vocal patterns, so they are not having vocal production learning in that way as we have. Um, well here, I have to say, in the models that we have used so far, so there are indications or there seem to be indications that there are some mammals that are able also to uh, perform vocal production learning, but these study, um, um, mammals have not been thoroughly studied in the lab with controlled experiments, so that I want to stick with the data here and say that from the data set we have at this point, um, the mammalian vocalizations are mainly innate, right? And to put this in contrast, so from a, to look how how it looks like in a vocal learner, that in a vocal learner it's really not mainly innate. I know that you know that it's like that in humans, so that deaf humans have really hard time to learn their human speech and they have to do it with some, some other techniques, but also in other lear um, learners, vocal learners that we know, um, we know that they need auditory feedback. So this is, um, well, it's the, the only bird that will be in my talk today, so we will hear much more tomorrow. Um, so this is um, a zebra finch. And um, so what, what has been done here are these classical deafening experiments that actually, well, this is a very recent study of Mori and Wada there. Um, actually, this was started by uh, Mark Konishi when he was with Peter Mahler, that they, well, not zebra finches, but that they deafened birds at a very early stage and looked how their song evolved in songbirds. It was very similar like here. So what we see here in the upper trace is a, well, a yeah, song or songs of uh, a zebra finch and we see that this is the typical yeah, um, display of how a zebra finch sound looks like when we look at it as a spectrogram and down here is the, uh, the song of a zebra finch that is, has been deafened at a very early age and we see that well there is, are still these animals are still producing syllables and easy so also some artificial songs but it's, I, I think it's very clear to see that it's completely de deteriorated mm -hmm. and these um, birds really are dependent on auditory feedback really to maintain their songs properly. So how, is, is this, how does this look like when we are doing this in mammals? And there are several experiments actually who looked at that. I just want to point out a few of them. Um, one of the first ones actually um, that have been done um, are 
when we take out the studies that have been in the 60s and 70s where we don't really have nice spectral sums that I could show you here. Um, so this has been done in cats. This is a vocalization of a normal hearing cat. This is a vocalization of a deaf cat. And I think it's clear, even though that this call is a little bit shorter, this, this example, that these, the pattern of these calls are more or less the same, even though that the, the one ca cat is hearing and the other is deaf. Vocalizations of the deaf cats are a little bit louder. Why, why, why is that? We will talk about this a little bit later in my talk, but more or less it's the same pattern, right? And um, this is also, as we heard this morning, um, also in mice. So we, there are several mammals where we can find that. Um, that we, so what we have here are four traces, uh, four examples of vocal traces of four mice. And I think I, I, if I wouldn't know which two mice are really the two that are deaf, I, I wouldn't bet on which two um, bet, um, mice are deaf in this um, figure here. And uh, well, it's the, the middle ones, but you, you see there's, there is inter-individual difference. It's kind of typical for mouse vocalization, but when you do quantitative analysis, and that's what um, Kurt did here, then you really see that there are no differences between normal hearing mice and um, deaf mice. And this is also actually true for monkeys. So also in monkeys, you can deafen monkeys and they have the same vocal repertoire with the same patterns than monkeys that are normal hearing. Okay, that's the one point. So it, they're mainly innate, these vocalizations. Another point is that these vocalizations um, seem to be the expression of the, uh, yeah, of the emotional state of these animals. This means so that each um, of these call types that these animals are pre produced are producing are directly bonded to a specific motivational state in these animals, right? So that when the animals are in an alarm situation, they're automatically producing these, these alarm calls because they are in this, in this state to produce these alarm calls, right? And this is actually something which also um, um, makes them um, directly homologous, also for several other reasons, but um, homolo directly homologous to our nonverbal vocal utterance that we are producing, like for example, laughing, crying, or moaning. So these are, so to say, our ancient primate vocalizations that we are still, still producing, right? So that we can use these mammalian vocalizations at least as a model to, um, to look at um, our nonverbal vocal utterances, right? So there is something that we have in common with these vocalizations. And this also brings me to the last point that these mammalian vocalizations are assumed to be highly effective so that there is not or not much volitional control over these vocal apparatus when they are performing these calls. And I know this is something, this is highly controversially discussed, also very emotional, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, because some people say, well, of course it's effective, others say none. They are learning, they are learning their calls. And I think one of the reasons for this dispute is that actually both could be true, right? On the one hand, I think we could easily accept that vocalizations are effective um, since we know how hard it is to, uh, from our own um, primate vocalizations, um, laughing for example, how hard it is to inhibit laughing when somebody is telling us a funny story or a joke or is tickling us for example. It's, we really have a hard time, at least some of us, um, to inhibit this, this vocal utterance and we really have to learn, we can learn that, but we have to learn that maybe to inhibit these, this vocal behavior, right? That's the one side. The other side is that we could argue, well, vocalization is, it's a motor act, right? It's just a motor act like any other motor acts that we are doing, like an arm movement or a finger movement or something like that. And we do not have any problems to do that, right? And actually we can also train animals, monkeys for example, pretty easily in a pretty short time to move their fingers to perform a specific task to get a reward, right? So the question is what, is, what is so special about vocalization in this sense? And I think this is getting clearer when we look at the vocal motor network as it is supposed to be at the moment um, when, when, when asking this question. So what you can see here is a sagittal section through a mammalian brain. So in this case, it's a squirrel monkey brain. However, um, it seems to be pretty similar in, uh, in other mammals. Um, all these color structures you can see here are part of this um, vocal motor network. Uh, what's and what's also on this is actually also an important point is 
um, a structure that is not involved in vocalization in mammals, and this is the, the motor cortex and the pyramidal tract, so in this, in this case the um, corticobulbar tract um, that goes directly from the motor cortex to uh, the uh, um, motor neuron pools, the cranial motor neuron pools that are situated in the lower brainstem. Um, they, they are not, not needed to produce these vocalizations, so these vocal motor network is a more or less complete extrapyramidal system um, that is uh, encompassing several structures. Um, the most important part of the system are these blue structures shown down here. So this um, other structures seem to be the structures that are capable to produce the vocal pattern generate pattern, the vocal pattern, and are the vocal pattern generating network in this sense. Um, there are several structures that are connected with each other that seem to produce this pattern. Uh, we come to this later. Um, just so much there are two important structures. One important structure is the periaqueductal gray. So this is um, first of all a structure where we know from um, electrical stimulation studies that we can get all the vocalization, the vocal repertoire of mammals when we stimulate there electrically. And this is also the structure which is somehow the gating function within the system. So it gets most of the input um, of structures that are able um, to initiate or to modulate vocal output, they have their input to the PAG, so the PAG is somehow the entrance gate for all the structures that can modulate or initiate um, the vocal pattern generator. And these structures are, since these vocalizations are emotionally based, um, most of them are limbic structures actually, like for example the anterior cingulate cortex or the amygdala or the hypothalamus for example, right? Another important structure seems to be the lateral reticular formation within the system since this system seems to uh, encompass the vocal pattern generator per se, so the structure that is able to coordinate the pattern itself, so the pattern that we then hear or can also see in the spectrograms of these calls, um, since this structure has connections to all modern neural pools that are involved in vocalization. And that's another point that even though that it's not human speech, it's still a very complex vocal motor pattern. So we have to think that several muscles um, have to be orchestrated to produce a vocalization properly, like for example the laryngeal muscles, respiratory muscles have to be coordinated with um, the jaw muscles, for example, lip, lip and tongue, tongue muscles, and all they have to work together properly. And this um, that's the idea that this is done by the vocal pattern generator or mostly done by the vocal pattern generator down here in the brainstem. So to not completely um, yeah, kind of lose you maybe in the, in the break um, and you're not coming back since well I'm talking about stuff that is, has nothing to do with human speech and uh, maybe not to frustrate you too much, um, well there is a little well, there seems to be a little bit more. So there are some indications that animals are actually, even though that they're not able to um, volitionally control the vocal pattern, that they are at least able to take cognitive control over the onset of the vocalization. So when to place a specific vocalization in time. And this means then that, of course, there, there sh should, should be a structure existing that is capable to kind of take control over the system, to hijack the system, and so, what we suggest is that this is um, the prefrontal cortex, well, who else, um, to, uh, to take cognitive control over the system. And this is um, the, that what I will talk about in the second part of my lecture about all these co cognitive control mechanisms, behavioral evidence that we have that there is something like cognitive control and also about neurophysiological data that there are really structures in the brain that are capable to control or at least to encode these um, cognitive um, vocal, vocal mechanisms. But just once more, um, what's really important also for the first part of my talk is uh, all this tissue up here, which is also called cortex, we don't need that really just to produce the pattern of these calls. And this is actually something which has shown pretty nicely already in the, uh, in the early 80s um, by Jürgens. So, Actually, in this time, there was already this discussion going on, so whether these primate vocalizations are learned or whether they can be used as a, as a model for, for human speech. And so therefore, what, what, um, what, what they did in this study is they, well, it was a time where it was still able to do this 
without any problem, they, or with only minor problems, they, they made lesions in specific areas in the brain to make sure they made these lesions bilaterally. And for example, they made a huge lesion in the, what they call face co cortex. So that's the part of the uh, somatosensory and motor cortex that is responsible to control or to get the information from all the cranial, cranial muscles. And also just to make sure they also made a lesion in the <coughs> ventrolateral um, prefrontal cortex. Um, they didn't know whether there is something like a Broca's area in the squirrel monkey, but just to make sure that they lesion this area as well. And in addition, they also did some other lesions, so SMA, which is involved in, in, also in volitional control, ACC, which is known to be involved in vocalization, so in the initiation of vocalization, of primate vocalization, and also the medial frontal cortex also was also lesion from the bilaterally. Then they looked at the vocalizations, they took the feed calls, and just, it's a nice long um, pattern constant frequency call and looked at these vocalizations prior to the, this um, surgery and after the surgery. And the result is that. So maybe just get on the press to these calls, these constant frequency calls. They're pretty nice long constant frequency calls where you could easily imagine that they, they, they could be deteriorated. Something could go wrong when you are listening to something that is somehow important for these vocalizations. But I think it's pretty convincing there is, there's nothing happening. So these animals are still producing these calls. Maybe the, the call rate is going down in some of these regions. So when ACC is lesions, the call rate that these animals are producing these fees is decreased, but still when they are producing a fee, it still looks like a, a proper fee, right? And the same, we'll just put it in briefly, since Julia talked about this extensively this morning, it's also true when we look at other other mammalian species like in, in, the, in these mice without cortex, um, as you already said, even there, they did a quantitative analysis, a really nice quantitative analysis, what Jürgens didn't do at this time for several reasons. Um, the spectrograms weren't that nice and it took very long to, to do them. Um, and even there, you don't find any difference between um, animals with cortex or without cortex. Yeah, hey, Julia? Can you go back one slide? Yeah. Um, so, the Face cortex, mm -hmm. uh, post-operative, it looks a little bit different. I mean, that spectrogram. Did they discuss this further or not? No. No. Well, you're right. That you mean this um, kind of. Uh, well, on the right hand side, post-operative, sort of a little weaker or whatever. Ah, okay. Yeah, so they didn't discuss that. So it's a large, largely, it's largely very similar, right? Okay. Okay, so, okay, but this is it for now. So, okay, now you know there's no colleagues needed for vocal pattern generation. Now let's go on. Um, so what I will talk about now, in the <coughs> rest of the, the first lecture is about these brainstem networks. And believe me, you will see that even the brainstem networks are also very interesting from the perspective of human speech since, well, on the one hand, you will see in the vocal pattern generator how this can work and how the I likely the vocal utterances in humans are produced. And the second part, the auditory modulation of vocal behavior, where I want to talk about is that there are several um, audio vocal um, effects we can find in humans that are actually also in, in mammals. So that maybe some of the, well, some of the effects or, um, yeah, yeah, effects that you can find in human speech that are also already present in in, ma in other mammals might let you think you over whether these effects are, are cortically controlled or whether they are controlled rather in the brainstem, yeah? And then the second part I will talk about cortical networks. Um, as I said, about the cognitive control of vocal behavior and these audio vocal integration mechanisms that might also be important for complex audio vocal communication processes. And as a very small excursion here again, um, I want to add something which is also important when it comes to, uh, to spoken language. And this is something actually what Kuhn Elements um, 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 told me or was talking about at the last meeting that I met with the bioacoustics in Monau, that he said, well, all these neurophysiologists, when they are talking about neural mechanisms, they are showing all these nice colorful slides and what structures are involved. And then they have this little, you know, this little arrow going down to say, okay, and this is then producing the vocalization. Problem is that actually also here, um, complexity is, is, is still there and there's still a lot of things going on. 
because of a very simple thing, because there is still a, uh, not a linear system that, that this um, the system is controlling. There is the larynx, which is a highly nonlinear system um, that has to be controlled. Um, and only when we also take this in account, um, what this larynx is doing or might be able to do, we are actually also able to uh, um, correlate our neurophysiological data we get um, correctly to uh, um, the vocal output that we are measuring, right? Very briefly, I promise. Okay, the laryngeal mechanisms. I know that's very peripheral, but still very important. Just very briefly, of course, as you know, you see a couple of figures already. Um, when we look at different mammalian species, we find a huge repertoire of different types of vocalizations. Some are very high at starting above 100 kilohertz, uh, highly frequency modulated. Some are very harmonic. Some are frequency modulated at a high frequency. Um, some of them have, have jumps, these frequency, sudden frequency jumps within their calls. Um, and all of this is produced by, by one organ, by the larynx. Of course, several animals have different larynges, different sizes, also different um, characteristics due to all adaptive changes during evolution, what was, was the best for them to survive. But this is also the same when we look at the vocal repertoire of a single animal. Like in this case, the horseshoe bat, uh, we can see that there's a huge repertoire of vocal utterances that these um, animals, in this case the horseshoe bats, are able to produce. Um, one of these calls are, um, I think what everybody knows somehow, are these echolocation calls that are produced from these animals to hunt their prey, that are mostly or in these type of animals, there are high frequency calls with a constant frequency. Second harmonic is um, amplified in these animals at 75 kilohertz. Fundamental is around about 38 kilohertz. And then there is a bunch of communication calls where we do not know that much so far. We just know they're producing communication calls, but you know, that's a, a huge field where if somebody's interested in, you could work with, I'm sure. Um, however, what I want to point out here is that the frequencies of these communication calls are much lower. And when we look at the fundamental frequencies of these calls, like for example in, in the example here, they are around about 15 to 18 kilohertz, and the echolocation calls are at 70 kilohertz in this subspecies, the Nippon, um, which means fundamental 35. So that this larynx, this tiny larynx of this 18 gram bat, 18 gram heavy bat, is producing a frequency range which is encompassing more than 18 kilohertz. And this is, I would say, it's, it's astonishing. So how a single organ can encompass a, a frequency range that is, that is that large, up to 80, some of these animals, 20 kilohertz of frequency range. And this is even getting more a riddle when we look at the rare um, neurophysiological data that are out there. For example, um, here there are some data from um, Schuller and Rübsamen. They recorded in the laryngeal motor neuron um, neuron pool that's very, very deep in the brainstem. And the part that we're recording here, this part is um, controlling the cricothyroid muscle. That's the muscle that is responsible for the tension of the vocal folds. It means the higher the tension, the higher the frequency. And when you measure the activity uh, of these, um, so each of these colors is an individual neuron. Um, these bats are producing these calls. They are able to produce these calls um, with different frequencies, and when we look at that, um, the lower the frequency of these calls, the lower our neural activity. So there seems to be a nice linear correlation between call frequency and yeah, the spike count. However, the spike count goes down to null at around about five, five to seven kilohertz, which, which mean that actually when we look at the communication calls, which are about 18 kilohertz below um, the echolocation calls, they, they shouldn't be able to produce these calls with this with this, uh, with, with this neurons. So, so what could that be? So one thing could be it's, okay, there are several neurons that are producing, that some neurons are producing the high frequencies, some are more for the low frequencies. However, that's not that likely for a couple of reasons. Um, so what we did is, um, that was during my time um, at Walter Metzner's lab at UCLA, did together with Kota Kobayashi, who was another postdoc at that time. Um, so we did these excised laryngeus preparations. So take out this instrument um, and blow air through it. It has been done in a couple of birds already and some other mammals. And to see what we can get out of this dead tissue, right? And whether we, we have some nonlinearities in there. So we did that, blow humid air through that thing. 
And what we get is shown here at the beginning. So we, so what is up here is we, the increase in air pressure that we are applied. Down here is what we get out of the larynx. So yes, we get we get some sound out of this laryngeal. The sound is increasing. Interestingly, it's around the resting frequency of these calls um, they produce prior to their death. And down here's the amplitude, which is around about 70 decibels. So this is really something we, we could expect. So it's really a noise that is a, a sound that is getting out of here. Now, when we further increase the air pressure, what we get is at a specific point, a jump downwards to another frequency band. And then again, after the sudden jump, so this is happening in, in two or three cycles, so very, very fast jump. Um, and then when we go back, and decrease the air pressure, it is then going up into this higher frequency band again. So this is one of these nonlinearities that we can find in several laryngeas. However, up to now, nobody really has looked precisely what these different frequency bands could, could work for. And so we did this in, in a few bats. Um, I looked at the range of the low frequency band and the high frequency band in these four bats. They are slightly different for these two uh, subspecies of so a Nippon and Tragatus. And what we then did is we compared these um, frequency ranges with the frequency ranges of the um, echolocation calls and communication calls of the groups where these bats were taken out. And what we then see is that, well, these frequency ranges actually fit pretty nicely to each other, that these communication calls are in the range of these lower frequency bands these laryngeas are producing and the echolocation call in this higher frequency band. So that it is not like that, that the bats have to kind of lower their frequency um, to, to lower the frequency, they kind of have to decrease the activity in the, in the cricothyroid muscle. What they have to do is they have to increase the air pressure that is uh, um, blown through the larynx to get to this lower frequency band to then produce these, these communication calls. And this, uh, why, why am I telling you this? This is something because, well, at least some of the neurophysiologists always like, you know, like to do comparison between the vocal output and and neural activity and you know linear or exponential or whatever fittings are almost the thing what we want to see and well the thing is we really have to pay attention also to nonlinearities in whatever um, vocal communication system we are working right okay so let's now dive into the brainstem networks um, here start with the vocal pattern generation so the reach region of this network where the vocal patterns seem to be produced or are suggested to be produced. Um, and I say suggested because, to be honest, up to now it's not exactly known where and how the vocal pattern is exactly produced within this network. Um, for several reasons, there are barely done any neurophysiological studies in these structures. I don't know whether this is because they're very deep structures, especially in large animals like rhesus monkeys. You have to go very deep. They're very small structures. Hard to hit these structures, actually, especially when, when the animals are freely moving or moving their head. You can easily lose the neurons. Um, so that this is mainly based on, on yeah, lesion studies, stimulation studies, and also um, anatomical studies. And also, in, there were big debates in the 70s and 80s about where exactly this vocal pattern generator I was talking about, so this is able to coordinate the motor neuron pools, is situated. And I have the feeling from my conversations that I had with Jürgens um, that it was at least as emotionally um, as the conversations we have nowadays about whether mammals do have <coughs> vocal production learning or not. Um, so some of these people, um, one of them was Chuck Larson, actually said, well, the vocal pattern generator has to be in the PAG, of course, because when you stimulate in the PAG electrically, you can get the whole repertoire of these animals. So what else than the, PAG, that the vocal pattern generator could be the structure that is capable to do that? Other people, like also Jürgen, said, well, if you're stimulating electrically in a pattern generator, you should get artificial vocalizations because you are stimulating artificially. So it can just be a structure that maybe is connected with the vocal pattern generator, but cannot be the pattern generator itself. Jürgens and some others said it is here in the lateral reticular formation. I have to admit, also I am one of the persons who said it's like that for several reasons. We will talk about these reasons in a, in a second. And then there are some peop people, Gerd Holsteig was one of them. Uh, I think it was a, he was a Dutch guy. Um, that, that, well, that probably the vocal pattern generator is here in the retroambiguous nucleus because we know for vocalization the respiration is very important and then the interplay with respiration because of course when there's a vocalization the animal shouldn't ins inspirate because then something is going wrong. Uh, so it's the retroambiguous nucleus. Um, 
and yeah, from, from the perspective we have now, I would say, well, kind of all these people are kind of right since all these structures are very important for the production of vocal speech, uh, vocal, uh, vocalizations, mammalian vocalizations. Since um, when you, if you um, lesion each of these structures, you get a deterioration in, in vocalization. So they are all important to produce these vocalizations. However, we are now interested in the vocal pattern generator. And there I want to ask you, so okay, so when we are looking for a vocal pattern generator, per se, so what would be the preconditions? So, what, um, so when we, for example, talk about um, blocking a vocal pattern generator, so what, what would, should be the outcome of, in an experiment? So you, you could think about this is a, a mammalian model, so you can do a, um, yeah, techniques that you cannot do in humans. So if, if you block the vocal pattern generator, let's say pharmacologically or even lesion the vocal pattern generator, what should happen? Maybe it's too easy to answer. <laughs> yeah. No more vocalization. No more vocalization for either no more vocalization or that the parts of the vocal vocal repertoire is lost, depending on whether there is one or, or several vocal pattern generators. Right. What else would be a precondition for a pattern generator? In general, so for example, when we are stimulating in the pattern generator, electrically or something like that. I know it's far away from the cortex. <laughs> and it's afternoon. <laughs> okay, maybe just not make it too, uh, uh, too long. So, well, actually most of, most of these points are already um, talked about. So first of all, what we would get is uh, when we are blocking this parent generator, as I said, um, we, sh we should eliminate vocal output. Another point is when we stimulate this structure electrically or chemically, what, what would be artificial in this case, we, would, we should get um, vocalization, but artificial vocalization. Another point is that, of course, the vocal pattern generator should somehow be embedded in this vocal pattern generating network in the brainstem. It should have connections to the motor neuron pool so that it is able to fine tune the, the activity in these, in these in motor neuron pools. And then, of course, when we are recording in these areas, we should get somehow um, yeah, a neural activity that is correlated with the vocal pattern because otherwise it wouldn't be able to produce this vocal pattern, right? Um, and actually, the only region that is um, kind of having these, all of these preconditions in common is actually the lateral reticular formation in the lower pontine brainstem. So that this is the reason why I think it is assumed that the vocal pattern generator is within this structure. And that was also the reason why we recorded in this area during my PhD thesis in squirrel monkeys to see how this region is um, producing um, yeah, neural, uh, producing sound. Um, so we did this with a telemetric recording technique. So the animals um, had um, a little box on their head which uh, uh, contains all the hardware that we needed like micro drives to move the ele electrodes up and down in the brain, uh, batteries and also transmitters to transmit the neural signal to an antenna. And th during that time the animal was able to freely move um, in its social group to socially interact with them, to vocalize, um, and well, at least at this time, even though that it's not that far away, 2006, that was a really amazing technique to work with. I know nowadays you can get these system off shelf with uh, 500 channels and more that you can record simultaneously, but still, well, still I think it's kind of cool. And so we recorded in this ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, in this structure down here in the ventrolateral pontine brainstem. So the electrodes went down the whole, whole the way down to this structure. And what we get were neurons that are depicted here on the left side. Now here on the left, upper left, this is um, the depiction of the activity of the single neuron. I think since we see this the first time in this meeting, I will guide you through this figure. So what actually we can see here. So this is the activity of a single neuron um, in response to vocalizations of these animals. Um, the activity is triggered by, by the onset of the vocalization and the vocalizations we took here were these um, trills, trill vocalizations these animals are doing. These are highly frequency modulated vocalizations with a repetitive character. When we listen to them, they sound like this. Yeah, it's almost like birdsong, um, but innate. Um, and here in the middle, there is um, the raster plot. So this is the activity of that neuron in response to uh, several 
vocalization. So each line here is the activity of this neuron to one vocalization. And each dot that you can see here is one action potential that this neuron was producing, right? Down here is the spike density histogram. So this is kind of the mean activity of this neuron um, shown here. And what we can see here is, first of all, the activity of this neuron is starting prior to vocal onset, around about 40 milliseconds prior to vocal onset. So it, it could be a premotor vocal neuron. And in addition, what we can see is that this neuron is showing this clear um, syllable correlated activity. So it's sticking very precisely with this pattern of these vocalizations. Other neurons that we could record in this region, um, actually all of these neurons we were recording in these neurons were duration correlated. A few of them were syllable correlated and duration correlated means that the duration of the neural activity that was accompanied with a, a specific um, vocalization was directly correlated with the length or with the duration of this vocalization, right? So also here they are sticking pretty nicely to one part of the pattern of these vocalizations. Okay, so all of these neurons were somehow call pattern correlated in this region. Now when we ha had a closer look on uh, really on these pre-onset times of these, of these neurons, um, what we did here is we, uh, we kind of created, well, well looked at the so-called pre-onset time of the syllables on the mean syllable pre-onset time for each neuron so that we look not only at the beginning of neural activity and the beginning, beginning of the vocalization but in the syllable correlated neuron at the beginning of the of each of these syllable correlated activities at the beginning of the syllable, so you have a more precise mean duration. So we did this on the one hand for this VOC, so VOC is this region um, in the ventral lateral pontum brainstem where we recall these neurons, the, all these call pattern correlated neurons, a few of them as I said, only a few were syllable correlated. And in addition we recorded in uh, some of the modern neuron pools that were, were ad adjacent to this region and were also, or, or are also involved in vocal behavior, um, literally they're the facial nucleus responsible for facial mo movements, motor trigeminal nucleus responsible for jaw movements for example, and the ambiguous nucleus responsible for um, laryngeal movements. What we can see is that within the modern neural pools we have pretty precise um, um, pre-onset times that are in a similar range which indicates that each of these modern neural pools is dedicated to do a specific part or play an important role in a specific part during the vocalization. Only the in these in this um, area, in the VOC area, we have a, a broader range of um, pre-onset time so that we, in this, we suggest that this would also give these neurons in this area the capability also to uh, um, control several modern neuron pools that have all the different patterns within these modern neuron pools. Of course this is preliminary and there has to do a lot more to really pin that down that this is the vocal pattern generator. Another big thing we have to do um, and hopefully we will have data to that very soon is to uh, pin down the intrinsic properties of this pattern generator, so how these um, neurons within this pattern generator are also interacting with each other. Okay, now come to the modulation of vocal behavior, so how the, um, if the, these brainstem controlled behavior can be um, um, modulated by a sensory input, in this case by auditory input, and what this might tell us also about yeah, sensor modulation um, of other um, motor vocal vocal acts we are doing, like speech, for example. And one is actually a one audio vocal behavior that I want to look at is actually a behavior that has been discovered in humans. Um, and here I'm talking about the Lombard effect. So it has been uh, interestingly also uh, um, also discovered in Paris. Um, by not a neuroscientist Etienne Lombard, but also a, a surgeon and an otolaryngologist. So he had patients and he found out that when he's playing back um, white noise to this patient that they're increasing, um, they call amplitude and also call frequency. And this is something what, I should make this a little bit more clear, something what we also have here during this meeting. So when you are at the poster back there um, and you're talking to each other, it's maybe not as big as SFN as you can see here, but still you are might be aware that you're not aware that you're increasing your call amplitude and also your call frequency and it is it seems that we are doing this to increase the signal to noise ratio to really make make sure to that we are sure to transmit a specific signal vocal signal to a receiver so when we are you know producing something we are using energy that just to make sure that this is really um, be properly transmitted to a receiver and this is an effect which seems to be pretty 
yeah, ancient in that way that we can find this um, effect in more or less all mammals that it has been um, investigated so far, and as far as in, a, also in all birds um, where it has been um, tested, um, they all have Lombard effects. So they have also all an increase in call amplitude, for example. These are just three random examples. Um, marmoset monkeys, free-tailed backs, and even in belugas, so some uh, more uncommon um, laboratory animals. Um, so that what you have here is the noise level on the on the x-axis and the relative call amplitude or call level on the y-axis. And we see in all animals when we have an increase in background noise, we have an increase in call frequency, uh, in call amplitude, excuse me, in all these animals. So this is a pretty preserved effect. And actually it seems um, that this effect is brainstem controlled actually, so that we don't need a cortex to uh, increase our call amplitude in this way. And this is well, what one in indication or evidence for that was actually in a, well, we would say a kind of, kind of cruel experiment that has been done here by Nonaka. Um, so what they did, so they de decerebrated cats during anesthesia, of course. So what they did, they cut, made a huge cut here prior to the colliculi so that the whole um, anterior part, subcortical and cortical part was kind of disentangled from the rest of the brain. And of course, these animals were anesthetized, so they couldn't vocalize spontaneously. And what they did is they, yeah, they stimulated the PAG. We know we can elicit vocalizations there. And they made here these meow vocalizations, what they did, just with simulation. And down here, you can see um, the same um, experiment with um, a masking noise. It was white noise with 80 decibel. And what we can see is that there's an increase in call amplitude at around about a 50%. Which shows, so this effect is still present in, during, during anesthesia and without, without cortex or these anterior subcortical structures. So that made us interesting actually. So how, well, how, this, how this could be uh, um, yeah, controlled in the brainstem. And well, this time um, we also want to know whether we can somehow behaviorally with a behavioral design can disentangle this. So, well, this is really in the brainstem and how this call amplitude, call frequency, how they are dependent of each other or not. And so what we did was also um, with Walter Metzner, um, we took again the horseshoe bed as a model to study that. Um, the horseshoe bed is an ideal model here, at least we think that, since it's producing this echolocation call with a high repetition rate. Um, so you can hear that when we, so this is transferred to the audible range. So this is far up in the 70 kilohertz range. But so when we are transferring it down, you see this is really with a very, very high repetition rate of around about 15 kilohertz. Um, so that, that was a, a, at least the idea when there are some temporal changes or frequency change, amplitude changes, we could kind of see this in a very, very fast way with short latency, right? So we played back to these animals, um, wide noise with an electrostatic speed because um, recorded their echolocation calls. And um, so what we did is, um, so we used a broadband noise around about 10 kilohertz broadband noise and shifted this broadband noise through the auditory range of the bats, which starts around about five or 10 kilohertz and goes up to a, uh, a 70 or 80 kilohertz, right? And what we can see, so this is just an extraction um, so we d had several um, conditions. Um, so the only condition where we got a significant increase in call amplitude was when the resting frequency of this part was masked. So only when the vocalization directly was masked, then we got um, this, this Lombard effect. All the other cases, we didn't get the Lombard effect. This also in correlation to data we already know from some birds and also from, from monkeys actually. Now what's about the call frequency? So uh, the increase of call frequency, and this is um, just one trace of these echolocation calls they are producing. So they're producing the echolocation calls. Then here the noise kicks in and all of a sudden you can see they're increasing the call frequencies of the echolocation calls. Um, we did this over and over again, of course, to quantify that. And we can see that there is a really nice and robust increase in call, uh, um, call frequency at the first call after noise onset. And this actually um, tells us two things. The first thing is that when we look here at the temporal um, resolution we have with these free, um, echolocation calls at around about 100 milliseconds, this is a very, very fast response, uh, which for many reasons um, tells us that this really has to happen on brainstem level. And the other part is that this is happening in the first call after call onset, uh, or after noise onset. And this indicates that um, the 
the bats do not hear to have to hear their first call within noise to figure out whether they are not loud enough. So it really seems that there is a feed forward mechanism or something like that within the brain, in this case within the brain stem, from the auditory side to the vocal motor side to kind of inform the vocal motor side to, to increase um, call frequency. And this uh, we also did with all these um, conditions we were, we were presenting. And here we could see that this shift in call frequency was present in almost all um, conditions we were, we were presenting, and especially in all conditions we were presenting below the resting frequency, we had an increase in call frequency. Um, so that also this shows us that it seems that these, um, as it often has been said, Lombard effect is the call amplitude, raising call, rising call amplitude with an accompanied rising call frequency that this seems to be not that correct in that way that um, this rising call frequency seems to be an independent mechanism from that um, increasing call amplitude. Okay, so another interesting um, behavior what we can look at, um, which also goes a little bit more to uh, to, to humans is, is the antiphonal calling behavior that we can also use to look at um, uh, modulation of vocal behavior. Um, I would say the person who established that, um, there were some preliminary data in the, in the 60s from uh, um, Plog actually, but um, so Corey Miller did most of that stuff when he was posting in Shaoxing Wang's lab. So what he did is he took two marmosets, put them into two cages, put a cloth in between and just let these animals communicate with each other. At least that's what he did in the beginning. And so that then they are producing these fee calls, these double fees to communicate with each other. And a typical communication situation was that, you know, one is, monkey is starting to vocalize and the other is responding. And then this is going this kind of oscillatory mechanism as Asif um, um, would, would call it. And this is not randomly, as you can see already, there are strict rules that are underlying this behavior. One is that um, the, um, other animals are responding in, um, pretty fast. So in a, in a time window of five seconds, they have to respond. The sender, so the, to uh, kind of get the sender to vocalize again. Otherwise, um, the sender isn't um, um, interpreting the vocalization it is hearing as a response to the vocalization he produced before. And also the sender is producing these calls um, with kind of um, constant, more or less constant intercall intervals at around about 10 seconds. And well, this is, well, we don't have to talk about whether this is brain stem controlled or not, five or 10 seconds, that's decades for the brain. Um, however, I was interested in this behavior in, uh, since I had still a huge data set on vocalization of my monkeys, of the um, squirrel monkeys, and there I found something interesting. So first of all, I wanted to look at uh, my squirrel monkeys, I had the, the opportunity since um, I had one monkey who had this um, box on his head. There was also a um, bone conduction microphone there which, so that I could separate the vocalization of this focal animal from other animals, um, from the vocalizations of the other animals and could correlate the vocalizations of my focal animal to the vocalizations of the other, of the other squirrel monkeys. And what I could find also, this is now all vocalizations of the other animals um, correlate with the beginning of the trill vocalizations of my focal animals. I see some, well, some mean distribution of call onsets of other call of other monkeys. And then there are these two increases in, in call onsets. And this is, well, it's probably not really antiphonal calling since they are still in visual, they can see each other visually, but this is also something like communication. So it, it might be trivial, but it's nice to see that also squirrel monkeys are producing vocalizations to communicate with each other and that they're responding to each other. Now, what I was very interested in and of found very interesting was this um, uh, temporal part here, just around the onset of the vocalization. And it seems um, when we look at here at the data that there is a decrease in call onsets right um, before and after the onset of the focal animal. And this kind of, again, also very, very um, short, something with very short latency. One bin here is 100 milliseconds. Um, and this seems that um, monkeys, in this case, um, squirrel monkeys, do not produce a trill vocalization when just before um, that point, when they want to produce a trill vocalization, another trill vocalization or another acoustic stimulus has been presented in, in its surrounding, probably also just to make sure to be able to trans transmit its own vocalization properly. So also there are very 
uh, very nice audio vocal mechanisms that are happening with very, very short latencies that are kind of leading us to that conclusion that this is happening on brainstem level. Now, before we are going for a coffee, um, of course, the question is for neurophysiologists always, where on the brain um, might this be encoded or where on the brain could be such an audio vocal integrator? And well, it, it, um, one idea is in this case, it, it is on brainstem level. And well, we, we're already recording in this region down here um, around this pattern generator. And so we're also presenting um, acoustic stimuli to these animals. In this case, we um, produced a wide noise burst just with a standardized um, stimulus to, uh, to look um, at the neural responses to the stimulus. And here on the left side, you can see a neuron this was, that was recorded here just in that area of the vocal pattern generator that showed a response like here on the left side. So the upper part here is the activity of this neuron in response to self-produced vocalizations. So you see that activity starting prior to vocal onset. So it has a premotor characteristic. Again, it is very close to the pattern of these calls. And when we play back acoustic stimuli to this very same neuron, we can see, oops, uh, we can see that this neuron is also showing an increased neural activity in response to this acoustic stimulus. So this is one of these neurons that, that is showing these audio vocal um, response characteristics. On the one side, they're responding like an auditory um, neuron to auditory stimuli. On the other hand, they are um, responding as a premotor neuron um, in uh, during self-produced vocalization, so that probably also this region um, might play also a very important role in these audio basic audio vocal integration processes I was just talking about before, and we also hope that we will have answers to that very soon. Okay, so summary of the first part. Um, so, so to, as a take-home message for that part is um, that we have this combination of nonlinear and linear laryng laryngeal properties that we always have to take into account when we are looking at um, neural responses and want to correlate them with the, with, with the vocalizations. And second part um, I was talking about was, um, and I hope that I could convince you that there are some behavioral and neurophysiological evidences that there are some brainstem controlled audio vocal control mechanisms and especially also um, audio vocal behaviors that we can also find in humans while they are producing their human speech signals. Okay. Thank you.